Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I know you're going to love today's episode. With me is Krista Montague. We are talking about challenging dementia behaviors. And for those of you who know, have listened long enough, you know, I had a few of those with my mom. So we'll be talking about those and others. So thanks for joining me, Krista. Oh, thanks for having me. So why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us about your company and maybe your background with um, caring for somebody with dementia, and then we'll dive right into the topic. Yeah, absolutely. So I run a uh, platform in a business called Dementia Success Path. Uh, the reason why I started it is when uh, I was very first getting started with my career, I ended up working in Jerry Psych, and that's where you run into the most challenging of dementia behaviors. That's why they're there. At the hospital, and my job there as an activity therapist was to uh, provide natural interventions. So what to say and what to do to get them to calm to a certain baseline in order for the doctors that work there to really be able to correctly prescribe medication. So anyways, that is how I got into the space. And over the course of many, many years, I cared for thousands of dementia patients with challenging behaviors. Thus, now I help caregivers on the internet with said challenging behaviors. Now, uh, yeah, so that's that's a little bit about me and my background. Awesome. While you were talking, I remembered a different scenario. So I hope I'm not going to throw this out of left field because this was a really challenging behavior. Um, and I want to keep it as anonymized as possible. So a, a resident who was very tall, who had been a what do they call like a endurance athlete did those like endurance marathons oh. for people who are not watching the youtube video this is a very ugh, i don't want to do that kind of face <laughs> and he got very agitated if he couldn't get a hold of his wife on the phone and she mm. was out of cell reception and he got so agitated he pushed over another resident who mm. broke a hip and we all know what happens when older people break hips and this was an issue she had with him. It's just like he had obviously greater than average, uh, um, what is the word? Oh, it's Monday. My brain's not going to work. <laughs> he just had a ton of energy. And mm. he needed like people to like take him running or like he, there, he needed a way of getting rid of the energy. And he, but he was out of stage of his dementia that, you know, taking him out wasn't necessarily safe for himself or others. So, um, just off the top of your head, what do you think you would do with that? Just, we're going to start off with the hard question first. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, so I guess I, I'd be curious to, to figure out some of, some of the why behind that. Cause ultimately behavior is just communication. Uh, the main thing with most of the dementias, uh, whether it be Alzheimer's or front of temporal or blue body or whatever is that it, it takes away language if you s stick with the disease process long enough. So over time, those behaviors become a way for them to say, hey, something emotionally or physically with me isn't right. And I can't tell you any other way than maybe to shove this person over or something like that. So it sounds like a, a couple of things are there, which is he has a physical need of moving around if that's been a part of his life and that's not being met. So that could definitely be part of it. And the other part is maybe an emotional need that's not being met, which is he's wanting to get a hold of his safe person, the person who he feels gets him and can help orient him. And it's it's not happening. And that can just feel so overwhelming when you've lost control of everything else in your life with dementia. So as far as tackling those issues, I usually like to start with the physical issue first before I tackle the emotional one. Uh, so... I understand it could definitely be challenging to get them to maybe run around the block. But I know where I happen to work, it w we had a pretty substantial backyard area, like garden area that people could walk around uh, or even like a little mini trampoline even. That'd actually be a great idea if he can't move anywhere and he's like, there's nothing physically wrong. He has no mobility issues going on. Just have him bounce on that trampoline and just count it out, like almost like treat it like a workout. 
he's having, like he might've had in sports or something like that, or maybe run laps around a few times or make it like some type of competition. Like he's beating himself with it. So there's all kinds of ways that you can help uh, productively put that energy towards something where it's safer. Uh, That was a lot of my job is figuring out how I could safely get these folks needs met so that if, you know, things continue to be an, an issue that, that then the doctor would come in with say like your Ativan or your Seroquel or, you know, whatever, things like that. Uh, it's a delicate balance trying if you're a psychiatrist that specializes in geriatrics to really get that right. And he really depended on us trying everything before he get to the medications. Be like, okay, so roughly we probably need this amount. But anyways, so I go there first uh, with getting those physical needs met. If he has a lot of energy and he just needs it met, there's there's always a safe way to get it done. It just takes a little bit of creativity. Uh, and knowing a little bit about his life and his background and what would make the most sense for, for him. So all that's very important. And then beyond that, uh, the emotional need could be uh, maybe he feels like there isn't anybody else that just sits and talks to him. And I know it's challenging in facilities. I I, I get it. I, I worked in a facility, but at the same point in time, uh, that's really where your, uh, let's just say your recreation therapist or your activity director can really be helpful with that. Uh, chances are maybe he could, like while that person's activity planning or something like that, could be sitting next to her, to her him or whatever. And, help him with these ideas and really building that one-on-one relationship so that uh, it's not such a desperate bid for that person. You know, ultimately there's always, there's always something you you can do, but I, I hear you. There's always going to be challenges when you're looking at an institutional place with staffing, with training, all that type of stuff. But, you know, every single person's different and, uh, it, it was it was rare when there was ever a person where I'm just like no we can't we can't help him like it, it was it was very 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 rare that, that that would ever be a situation that we'd find ourselves in. I'm wondering if they actually had gone to a geriatric psychiatrist. I'm thinking no, but I didn't know everything about their situation. Obviously, sure, um, sure. that probably would have been a really good solution because he'd been in one memory care community and they just. I'm not sure they tried very hard. <laughs> um, that one used to be a mile down the hill from my home. And there was a reason my mom wasn't there. And the one my mom was at, he had been moved there. So the whole incident with the shoving was, and the person who got shoved was the parent of a client of my husband. So it was like, oh, uh-huh. it was all the dramas. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah. Um, it resolved It resolved pretty well. I mean, there wasn't lawsuits or um, everybody was level-headed and came to some some agreements that were positive so that was good because i was like oh god we don't we're like do we really need to get lawyers involved because you know this this is just a really ugly situation but i i question whether whether they had a psychiatrist because that might have helped because they did have a really beautiful outside courtyard i don't know that it would have been enough space i mean it was basically the size of an olympic pool so he could have run down and back and around, but I'm wondering if he would have felt like like a hamster on a wheel, just kind of going in a circle. But I like the trampoline maybe, maybe. idea. It, it depends on the context you're you're putting it in. It it, it really does. If, if you're really treating it like, hey, this is you know a workout that we're doing t- together, like a training workout. If he was a big sports guy, then it could make sense for him. It just depends. Um, as far as if the, I'd I'd say it's unlikely that the facility had one. And the reason being is uh, in the place that I worked at, it's a hospital. So it was meant to be short term. And that's usually how it goes. Oftentimes we see rightly so medication being a very last resort because It could take someone like him who is nothing's physically wrong with him. He's extremely physically active and it could mess with his balance and make it so he becomes a fall risk. Uh, So it's almost like you're borrowing from Peter to pay Paul when you're when you're introducing medications. I oftentimes the folks that come to our hospital, uh, they were violent, like they were spitting, 
Uh, they were biting, hitting people, danger to themselves or others. Like it was very, very extreme situations where they would be like, okay, like the drugs are like the very last resort to managing this. Um, yeah, I, and I can understand in, like, you know, memory care or uh, skilled nursing or something like that. It's it's challenging to have somebody so physically strong around with a bunch of frail people around for sure. We certainly well, had quite was, a few of those. Yeah, he's really tall. And then none mm-hmm. of the caregivers, um, most of the, like 99% of them were women and they weren't, mm-hmm. none of them were more than average height. Most of us were pretty, yeah, we're talking like five foot two to five, six or seven at best. So it's not like they had like big, tall, you know, burly women to do, you know, control him, which, you know, physically controlling him isn't really in the, in the options either. But yeah, it was just, it was one of those situations where it's like his, you know, his care partner was just at her wits end and she was out of cell range because she was doing something for herself and their religious community. And so the fact that he sure. freaked out that he couldn't get a hold of her was really unfortunate, but you know, and yeah. I'm hoping that they learned something, you know, like all of this happened in like 2019 and then we had the pandemic and mm-hmm. my mom passed away. It was like, Oh, like it was just, it was like a whole lot happened in a couple of years, but you were talking about violence. And so now we're going to shift back to mom, my mom. Okay. And okay. The, the more we, so we, Talked a little bit about this. The more help she physically needed. Now, my mom walked fine with no AIDS. She had nothing physically wrong with her either. She had just had Alzheimer's for nearly 20 years. The more help she needed, the nastier she got. She didn't want people to help her. She didn't think she needed help. And if you pressed the wrong way, she literally scratched people and drew blood. So Mm. a little bit violent. Um... They were always so surprised because like, oh, she's so easygoing. I'm like, you're not talking about my mother. <laughs> my mother was <laughs> never easygoing. <laughs> you know, she was she was a very lovely, nice lady, did lots of things for the community, loved her family and all that. But don't piss her off because yeah. that was a bad idea. And it did not help after Alzheimer's if you pissed her off. So I know we're kind of going back to lack of training, lack of um time lack of staff which you know is actually has gotten worse since my mom passed away but they never seemed to be very good at diffusing the anger that came up kind of quickly and it was always mm-hmm. it always made me feel so bad when she's when she drew blood on the gal that took care of her because mm-hmm. that gal put up with way too much garbage yeah, so it's well go ahead oh sorry go ahead <laughs> no, go i was gonna say when you've got Somebody who doesn't think they need help, that was the worst with my mom. It's like, mm. you know, and I actually experienced it. We'd come back from, I always took her out. We went and watched kids in the park or whatever. This was what gave her the most joy. And we came back, she needed to use the restroom. And she was, you know, she was still fairly continent, but she needed depends um, just in case kind of thing. And as we all have happened you know, her toe gets caught in the elastic and she's grunting and groaning and pissing and moaning, <laughs> trying to pull the, first off, she crossed her legs and then tried to pull up the, mm. you know, the incontinence underwear. And I'm like, I know exactly what's going to happen if I help her because she's going to get angry at me. And so I let her fuss and fume for a few minutes. And I thought, this is ridiculous. And I went in and I said, oh, you just have your toe caught. That happens to me all the time. And I like grimaced and I bent over and I unhooked her toe and I literally backed up and stood up as quick as I could. Thankfully, I did not get smacked. That was what I was expecting. And I left the bathroom. I left her to do the rest of her stuff. She had her clothes back on. She comes back in her room, absolutely spitting mad. And I'm like, you know, this is ridiculous. It's not like I, I didn't even touch her. All I did was unhook the elastic from her toe which you know if she didn't have alzheimer's she would have understood that that was the problem but she was so mad she like right around people coming here dead. <laughs> and she stomped out of yeah. her room and i thought okay well i guess i'm gonna go home now and she made a circle around <laughs> the residence came back in her room she goes oh hi what are you doing here and i was like oh crap now we can start the visit all over again <laughs> Like, should have left oh. a minute and a half ago. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, man. 
Yeah. So, you know, it's funny. I was actually having this discussion recently. I don't know if you've heard of Dan Salinger. He's pretty big on TikTok, like a really big caregiver on TikTok. I was just interviewing him on my Instagram and we were talking a little bit about uh, really how memories aren't quite as straightforward as a lot of people initially think. Something I really noticed uh, with a lot of people with dementias, like all kinds of dementias, is that while the dementia stole the information aspect of their of their memories, and memories are really both comprised of both emotions and information. So you notice that a lot of the emotions behind their experiences would really linger. Uh, so, for example, if I'm sure if mom, like, so my thought when you're talking about mom is it's possible maybe somebody else pissed her off earlier in the day and she didn't necessarily hang on to the information of what made her mad earlier, but she was maybe hanging on to the emotion from it and it's possible that maybe the her toe getting stuck and you helping her she's like no one respects me like this is just like the fifth thing that someone's disrespecting me with and now my daughter's doing it to me like gosh darn it so for her emotionally it feels like this is I'm just so tired of not having any control over my life or I'm just so tired of like people telling me what to do all the time talking to me like I'm a little kid like just all those are very valid feelings of anger, but since the information gets like poof out of their brains, all it looks like is, wow, they're really overreacting to that to being stuck in their pant leg. So sometimes it's not always the easiest to try to discern, like, was I the fifth thing that pissed her off today? Because <laughs> uh, she probably won't be able to tell you. But uh, anyways, how I guess Dan and I came came through that is he noticed that like maybe when after he got his dad to shower and his dad was mad the anger would just kind of linger for a few hours afterwards even when he completely forgot and he even had a shower so it's it's just so yeah it's so interesting how all that works it's uh but it could be both helpful and unhelpful simultaneously uh as far as them forgetting things or the emotions lingering so uh anyways those those are the thoughts i had the lack of control, something mm. that she had. So she was the oldest of four kids. And so, you know, she was always responsible for the younger siblings. And I mean, I'm the oldest of two, so I can relate to that. Um, my dad wasn't the easiest person. He, you know, my he worked. My mom took care of my sister and I. And he kind of kept control of things. And whenever she wanted to do something, like if she wanted to repaint a room in the house, she'd think about it. She wouldn't talk to anybody about it. She'd think about it. And then she would announce, ta-da, I'm going to do this. So it sounded like literally like it came out of the blue. And I mm. knew that it didn't because I think about things and then say, I think we should do X, Y, Z. Like our closet door is, it's irritating. And it's like, we're going to put a barn door on here. So I talk about it, then I research it, then I share the research. So I'm not like, bam, you know, <laughs> we're going to do this. And it sounds coming out of the blue. So I don't think she felt like she had a lot of control, like her mm. whole life since she was a teenager, probably, mm. or maybe younger. Um, you know, my, both my grandparents worked. So my, you know, both my uncles were kind of rowdy. <laughs> She had the rowdy cousin that wound up. So, yeah, I don't think she felt like she had a lot of control. So even if it wasn't the fifth thing that pissed her off, even if it was only the second or the third thing that day. Yeah, I can totally see where that would have that would have been an issue. Yeah. So that, that, yeah. I've learned so much since she's passed away. It's like, dang, I really wish I'd known this five years ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's interesting. I find that anytime, regardless if they have dementia or not, if there's like a huge reaction that feels disproportionate, to the situation you're in, chances are it's probably not about you. It's probably about a bunch of other stuff. And it's very much the same with our folks with dementia. And that's usually the fastest way I can get them calmed down from anger is I would say, it sounds like there's just a lot of things that are frustrating you here. Let's just go outside and you can just tell me what's on your heart. And usually I was right. There's usually like six different things that were all pretty valid sounding. <laughs> that was pissing them off and it was really relieving for a lot of them to have someone actually really sit down and listen to them and uh you know it was a very unique position to be in uh as far as a facility goes 
to actually be the person who had a little bit more time to spend with with my folks to really understand where they were coming from a little bit more. It was really special. And it's really unfortunate because COVID, one of the other things COVID has taken out has also taken out this particular facility as well, which it stinks. But, you know, uh, COVID did a number on, on all of it. <laughs> and everything. On, on, on everybody, on all, all the all the things. Um, I guess I want to circle back real quick when we were talking about the staff and the training and things like that. Something I notice oftentimes just because of, maybe because it's just severely underpaid for what they're asking their folks to do is you and oftentimes will find culturally people who maybe came from more of like an authoritarian type parenting background and they see these adults who are acting like children in their eyes so they almost instinctively go back to like this authoritarian style parenting to these adults and it just doesn't work uh it, it just it just doesn't work and uh that's why, you know, the training is so, so important, but man, it's just rough when you live in a country where everything is all about the, the dollar. It's yeah. Nice. My, um, so where my mom lived, my, my husband's a real estate broker and we were talking about this exact topic because the people that did the hands-on carrying on my mom did not get paid worth beans because some yeah. of them worked at Starbucks for eight hours and then went and dealt with these you know, these people with dementias and like, I could barely deal with my mom for two or three hours at a time much. And that was on top of what all the other stuff I did, but I didn't work at Starbucks for eight hours and then come deal with my mom for eight hours. Like, nope, that, that was outside my abilities. So I, I always, you know, tried really hard to like make their life easier. But the gal that my mom was always drawing blood on, she, she just worked at the community and she was freaking poor and it you know and the i had a really good relationship with the executive director um if he was making big bucks he wasn't spending it he had an older model honda accord you know he wore polo shirts and khaki pants you know i'm not dissing pennies i shop there but that's kind of where he looked like he shopped you know he wasn't he wasn't wearing suits and i always i thought i don't know how you do this job because you got the staff to deal with you've got the residents to deal with you got the residents families to deal with like there are too many people to try to make happy there's not enough money for you but somebody's making money and so i had my husband like pull up the property taxes and when the building was built and we like kind of assessed like their expenses and it was like i don't know how anybody's making money doing this and it was expensive we paid 5600 dollars yeah. a month for my mom and then she moved in, in in March 2017. So every March she was reassessed. The um, memory care director was very kind. Always, you know, when you kind of got somebody's in a range of um, needs, always kind of scaled it to the lower end. And my mom fell, broke her leg, was bed bound, wheelchair bound. And she still skewed everything like as minimal as she could. And the the fee was going for 5600 to 7200 and I've said this a lot. I think my mom had a moment of clarity where she realized there was this COVID thing going on. You know, people were not allowed to come into the community. We weren't allowed to take them out to go watch kids in the park. She was going to need this wheelchair. The fee was going to, oh, forget it, I'm out. I really seriously think she had that moment because she died March 31st. The new fee was supposed to take place April 1st, so... She wow. saved us some money. Yeah, I was like, man, you've timed <laughs> that just right, honey. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that and it just wild. Yeah, it just seemed like there it just had to have been a moment of clarity. So yeah, it was it was crazy times. We were very blessed. They did let us come in. I saw her the day before she passed away. They called me on the 31st and said, Come now. Um, she passed away before we got there. But literally, so this is March 31st, 2020. We're still in the initial stages of quarantine, you know, two weeks to flatten the curve, all that. <laughs> if you guys remember back then, it's like <laughs> right, I almost I forgot that was the beginning of the year basically sitting at home. No, we, were, we, were, we were so innocent back then. Yeah, we, we, <laughs> we thought we were doing really good sitting at home, baking sourdough bread. <laughs> Oh, I was—I was most certainly not doing that at that time. I, I was—I was working with dementia patients. Then. Oh wow! Oh, so you? That yeah, was, nope. Yeah. I was doing my same stuff, but Ooh. there was ten of us. So there was, um, 
my husband and I, my daughter, son-in-law, my sister, her kids and husband, and one, my mom's sister and one brother. And my aunt wore a mask. So this was a little bit before masking because my aunt took care of my grandmother who had vascular dementia, lived on grandma's social security. So when my grandmother passed away, I don't understand why my family made this choice. Still don't. Well, obviously when my grandmother passed away, my aunt didn't have a career or money. So my aunt lives in subsidized senior housing and she has her own mental health struggles. She obviously knew that maybe wearing a mask was a good idea. And again, great relationship with the executive director, but that man looked like he was about to have a complete stroke because literally there's 10 of us standing outside my mom's room, including two kids. My niece was a, a teenager. My nephew was almost a teenager. And, you know, he never basically said, get the hell out. But it was very obvious on his face. That's what he wanted to say. <laughs> but, you know, a lot of people didn't get to see their loved ones at all. So I, I felt really blessed. And that must have been really, really hard for them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So one of the, one one of the other things we were going to talk about is like repetitive motions or movement. Like my mom yeah. would rub her leg and wring her. <laughs> it was the hand wringing that drove me the most insane because it <laughs> always seemed like she was, you know, like oh. And I I pretty sure it was self soothing because she would do it when we were having, you know, we were out in nature looking at the hills and watching children and just like very positive, calm moments and she would mm. do that which always ramped up my I don't have anxiety but I always felt anxious because it's like is, what is this is this just what why is she doing this yeah so what do we do for people that seem like there was um in the residence where mom lived there was a gal that literally walked constantly I'm like I made the joke that her family was going to have to pay for carpet replacement because she was like leaving tracks in the carpet oh man <laughs> um and she did she just walked and walked I'm like she must sleep like a rock because she literally walked for hours it was wow like, and she was fine she didn't need help which was a blessing but oh yeah yeah there was just there was just some residents, my mom included, that just did things over and over and over to the point where I wanted to smack my head against the wall. <laughs> just definitely well, not good for your brain. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I guess maybe two, two things here. So there's one that's definitely very much evidence-based and the other is, is kind of a hypothesis of mine just by observation. So first thing is we know for a fact that dementia changes how our folks uh, physically perceive world, the world or sensor, sensory wise, like visually, hearing wise, touch wise. We, we know from scientific evidence that that happens to our folks. Uh, I'm sure those, those of folks that uh, listen to your podcast also are familiar with Tipa Snow. And she will give uh, visual examples as to how these things change. So Knowing what we know as far as that type of stuff goes, my thought is as far as the repetitive movements or almost stimming type stuff is I feel like because the brain chemistry and the brain's changing, it almost, my hypothesis is that it, it might cause some neurodivergence. So maybe someone wasn't neurodivergent when they were younger and dementia over time has kind of made them maybe seek out more uh, like physical stimulation that feels good. To them just because those senses are changing over time with the disease process so uh that's only that's again there may or may not be a study that says that that's just been my hypothesis just watching so many of them do very similar things as your mom uh so things that really help honestly you can't tell them to stop they <laughs> never will so nope. it's, it's very much your best friend is handing them something handing them an item getting their hands engaged in things so that their hands are too busy to do the thing that bugs you. It's almost kind of the same thing a lot of people will do with like their little kids and like snacks. In America, it's so freaking weird how like little kids are all, like you have the ever present goldfish or like yeah. <laughs> I, I just always thought that's so weird that you that people do that. But it's almost like a similar thing. It's like almost acting like a little pacifier there. But again, I know agnosium, staffing issues and all that type of stuff. But truly. And unfortunately, that really is the only solution is like, how can you replace maybe the stimulation they're looking for with that hand patting, the hand wringing, 
Like how could we channel that to something a little bit more uh, productive or, you know, uh, honestly, at some point, you know, we're the folks that can change. They're not the folks that have the ability to anymore change. So it could be, you know, making a decision saying, Hey, if it's just driving me too nuts, I just need to give myself some space for a bit to cool down my own emotions so that then I can handle this. Definitely self care is and boundaries is super, super important as a caregiver. So yeah, th- th- those would be my suggestions as far as that type of stuff goes. I dealt with one person that like rocked constantly and, mm. and tapped. You know, mate, you know, it's kind of hard to do this on the, on the desk, but just, <laughs> and it's just like five minutes of that. And it was like, I just want to strangle it. It was like, stop that. It's just, it like, yeah. I don't know, rubbed certain nerves, just totally raw. And it's like, you know, you're, you're talking to yourself and you're like, they can't help it. I don't understand what the background is. I like your thought hypothesis of being becoming neurodivergent. Cause that kind of gives people you know, there's obviously uh, research and s- tips and advice on, you know, you, you said stemming, which I'm only familiar with just because I've, I've had a couple of clients whose children are autistic. So I'm, I'm like borderline familiar with some of that, but not very familiar. Now I'm going to have to go look some of that stuff up. But, you know, it's just like, it's just rubbing that nerve raw. Like after five minutes, it's like, knock it off. And you, you know, you have to learn how to figure out, like you said, to redirect them. And, you know, I, God bless the families that can put up with that because that was not me. So we, we tackled yeah. the, the, um, the two behaviors that were challenging for my mom with me and my mom. And part of our, my biggest challenge is my mom thought I was her best friend. So there was always this like formality that, you know, when you think of your best friend, you know, you, you can let your hair down, but you might not let your hair down as much as you would with like your spouse or your, your siblings, or, you know, maybe a parent, you know, we, we do kind of keep a little bit of, of decorum, let's say (laughs) with our friends generally, I don't know, that's how I am. So there was always that little bit of an issue. And so it made it a little bit harder to help her and Hmm. do some of these things because best friends wouldn't do that. So what um what behaviors do you deal with a lot that you think would help um the listeners understand how to handle better? Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. You know, something that really, really helps is uh, as far as, you know, you're seeing something that you want, a behavior you want to change, but you don't want it to become a conflict. Oftentimes coming at it from almost like an observational point of view, like, hey, so I noticed that you know, there's a little, a little something on, on, on your mouth right here, here, here. Do you feel, do you feel that right here? What, that, it, is that bothering you? And it's weird. As soon as you point it out and make it visible to them, they're like, yeah, it's like, here, here, I got a, I got a little washcloth for you. There, there you go. Here, we'll just, we'll just get it off real quick. Okay, great. Oh, you look amazing now. So it's, it's, it's less like you're telling them what they have to do. It's more like, Hey, I, I'm noticing this. Do you notice this? type thing so it's it almost like it gives them autonomy and space to make their own decisions 
in their own conclusions about, uh, you know, if some, if they believe that something is wrong. And oftentimes our folks with dementia don't believe anything is wrong until it is made visible to them. Like oftentimes they can't smell that, you know, they haven't <laughs> showered in multiple days. Again, the changes of the senses, senses over time with dementia. So it's oftentimes you have to be just pointed out uh, and have them notice it too, in order for them to be like, huh, like, you know, hey, I have this solution right here. So uh, that too. And I mean, beyond that as well, it's just, uh, man, just do do some, everybody's so obsessed with trying to solve the problem so freaking fast. But the truth is, if you just take some time to listen to, listen to them, uh, oftentimes they'll give you the solution to their own problem. Like an example of what I mean by that is, uh, Oftentimes, you know, people will say, I need to go home. I need to get home to my kids or something like that. Oftentimes, the very best reason why not is something that they'll provide you with if you're smart. So what that looks like is, oh, you know, I, I'm sure that you wouldn't leave, leave the kids home by yourself. Who do you think is with the kids right now? And chances are they'll be like, oh, um, probably like the babies. You're right. It, pr- the babysitter's probably with them. You're absolutely right, Barbara. Yeah. You know, I, I know you said you wanted to come come down here to to help us with something real quick. I'm sure sure the babysitter's fine with with them. You know, you work so hard as a mom. You deserve a break, huh? <laughs> it's just so that's that's really what it, what it looks like is is your because I know some people are like, oh, just go along with their world. But it's even beyond that. It's like what their beliefs are can change so fast. Like your best <laughs> friend is often asking, asking some questions or saying like, you know, I, you probably have somebody with them. Like, am I getting that right? Like who would be with them right now? And then they come up with their own answer and they, it's almost like they answer their own question. Of, that makes sense. Like, what's, what's happening there. So that then, because uh, oftentimes a trap you can fall into is like you offer up an explanation and then they're like, no, that's not what's happening <laughs> at all. <laughs> yeah, You're wrong, so, which doesn't help your yeah. uh, your sense of calm at all. <laughs> no, no, usually, yeah, usually if you're if you're the person that's like, you're absolutely, you're probably right about that. You can't lose. You can't lose. Yeah, affirming that they're right about something like that would help would have probably helped my mom feel more in control. I was shocked that we never had that. I want to go home thing because my mom, my, so my mom had Alzheimer's for 20 years. So we had plenty of time to have discussions that never happened. And she always said, I don't want to be a burden to you girls. And I want to live in my home forever. It's like, thanks. Those are mutually exclusive. And we never discussed (laughs) what would happen with mom. If my dad died first, which is what exactly happened. He just assumed she'd come live with me when he was in the hospital and she would stay with me for like three days, it was really obvious that that was not a good idea. Not for her, not for me. Mm -mm. (laughs) It was like, I was glad that we had that, that taste because, you know, that's what everybody assumed. And that was not happening. It would, it just would not have been good for my mom or me. And I was just shocked, but I, I've learned, you know, that, wanting to go home sometimes is not a place, but a physical feeling of security and, you know, love and like all the, all the positive emotions you kind of get when you think of home is also what they're trying to sense. So, um, you know, you kind of have to figure out what they, what they're trying to do. What I never experienced anybody in mom's community. They would try to leave, but I think it was just kind of like muscle memory. Like, Oh, this person's going out that door. I'm going to go out that door. And they'd have to redirect. But the funniest thing that there's when my mom was for like the first year she was there, so many of these older ladies that had to use the phone. Where's the phone? I got to call my son. Where's the yellow pages? Oh, my God. Just cracked me. I had the hardest time not laughing because I'm like, I'm not sure I've seen the yellow pages in a long time or a phone book. Like there are probably people here, here that have zero clue what that is. And one day I um, so my mom. Her name was Diane. She befriended other Diane and they befriended other other Diane as if having (laughs) Alzheimer's wasn't bad enough. Yeah. Well, it was convenient because you didn't have to. I'm terrible with names. I didn't have to remember anybody's name. 
names. They all have yeah, the same so name. Yeah, Diane. <laughs> yeah, worked out fine. Um, and, you know, they had a great time together. But there was one day, other Diane was gone. And I was like, oh, where's your friend Diane? And she's like, we, I'm Diane. So we went around around with that. And somebody else was like, why don't you call her? And I'm like, well, I don't have her phone number. She's like, well, go get the phone book. And I'm like, oh, my God. It's so funny. Oh, man. It was just, you know, but um, there was something I was going to say earlier. You were t- We were talking about, oh, like the gentleman who had like the real physical needs to run and mm. do all this sneaky yeah. training stuff. <laughs> sure. I'm, not, I'm not running. Uh, we live in the Sierra foothills. If there's a bear, I'm lunch because I'm not running. <laughs> I've always said that. If I have my bike, I might be able to outrun the bear, but... I don't know. It might be a race, but um, yeah, I'm not a runner. That kind of situation is, especially in a memory care community, would be really helpful. F- you know, because you were saying if somebody could sit down and talk to him, like when the the partner was gone, having other family members like myself that could be like, like I knew the spouse. I didn't know him. I didn't even actually see him. He was on the opposite corner from my mom and. I don't know where he was when we were there, but I never actually saw him or the gentleman that got pushed over. But I could have sat and talked to him or, you know, we could have gone in the um, courtyard and and chatted. And it sometimes I think having somebody else that's like one step removed is easier than like, you know, all about them. So it's it's very mentally challenging to sit there and pretend that you don't have you don't already know the answers to all these questions so you know it's I was always the captain of mom's care team it was very obvious that there were family members that expected the staff to do things and not cater to them but it's like they're not here for you they're here for your loved ones so stop acting like an entitled idiot because you're going to leave and your loved ones are going to be stuck here with these people that you've pissed off so stop doing that my mom did not live in memory care very long before I was like, nope, that's a very bad idea. I'm in charge, but they're in charge. So we all got to work together. So I would think being able to work together and, and help in situations like diffusing the situation. Like I would take one or both. And I never took both Diane's with my mom. I would take my mom and other Diane out to the regional park There was one day that mom and other, other Diane, we went to the nail salon. Another day we went to McDonald's because other, other Diane wanted a burger. Like burger was on her mind. I'm like, fine, we'll just go get a hamburger. We'll go to McDonald's with the play zone, watch some kids. There were no kids. The bench was really uncomfortable. So we, we didn't stay there that long, but it was actually easier to take both of them than it was to just go with my mom. People thought I was insane. Mm. But I, I think it's that's something that we all should like, you know, we need to team up. Like, you know, we talk about getting help and self-care. And even if your family member's in memory care or even if they're not, maybe, you know, you know, somebody from the doctor's office, the church, adult day program. And you'd be like, can you just come over here and like talk to dad because I'm about to kill him. You know, yeah. <laughs> I think I yeah. think we need to team up like that more. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, something that happens so much is, uh, again, bless their poor innocent hearts. A lot of uh, caregivers think, as as soon as I place my loved one in memory care or skilled nursing or whatever, like that's when my journey ends as a caregiver. It's like, no, 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 no. You your role has just slightly adjusted a a smidge. That's all it's done. Your your work is far from done. Yep. If you especially if you want your loved one to get quality care for all the reasons we laid out our healthcare system just is so poor yep. <laughs> so poorly set up like i don't i'm with you i don't blame the workers one bit they're honestly kind of victims of the, of the system too uh i genuinely think it's just like a tiny one percent of the whole healthcare system is honestly winning at this the rest of us are losers uh but you know at the end of the day you know they're the, the workers are there to do the work uh, there because they care about helping folks. And I think you're so right that as a community, we really should come together and make sure that we're all taking, that all of us ha- are taken care of and all the good stuff. So yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. I had other family members I befriended 
And then there was other family members that just acted like, you know, the rest of us families were like part of the walls. Like they just mm-hmm. didn't want to deal with other family members of people who lived in the memory care. And I always thought that was dumb, especially it's like, you do realize I'm the one that's taking your mother with out with my mother. Like, you know, maybe you could like, acknowledge my existence. Like I'm not expecting like thanks and, you know, like throwing flowers at me or anything silly, but just acknowledge my existence, please. <laughs> it was so yeah. weird. It was so strange. And then mm-hmm. I had a lot of friends who'd already been through the journey and they didn't want it. It's like, been there, done that, really don't want to talk about it. Like, they'll listen for a few minutes, but then it was like, so I never really had the support that people are getting nowadays because when I, when my mom, after my dad died in 2017, we put mom in memory care, you did not share this stuff on Instagram and TikTok and all that like people do now. It's, it's a hundred percent different. I think it's better, but yeah, it's like, I was very, very careful what I shared about my mom because... I didn't want to upset people and I didn't want to be disrespectful to my mom. So it was, it was a whole different, different journey. Yeah, I I agree. It should absolutely be normalized because I just the rate in which dementia is getting people these days, I genuinely think it's all going to hit us at some point. Like every single one of us, either you're going to care for somebody, you're going to have it at some point or someone, you know, is, is going to have it or be a caregiver at some point. Like you're going to fall in any one of these categories. Uh, so it's just silly to think that it's not going to affect you because it absolutely, it absolutely will. So we might as well, uh, you know, be each other's village. You know, they talk about it so much, you know, with small kids, like where'd the village go? Yeah. You could say that with elder care too. Where the heck did the village go? You yeah, know, I th- it burned down and they ran away. <laughs> I mean, my hope, is, honestly, as we can see the whole system of capitalism starting to fail us epically right now I, I think maybe this could be an opportunity where we could think to ourselves look uh, clearly the individualistic society isn't freaking working and we need to go back to a time where we really uh took care of each other and the community members and it doesn't matter if it's you know my mom or you know my child or whatever you know we could all pitch in and be there for each other. I think it's great that that's something that you did during your mom's journey. Well, I've always said, so my political beliefs are we need to take care of ourselves, our family, our neighbors, our community, our state. And you can see these ripples going out. And, you know, I'm not necessarily a giant advocate for small government, better government. Yes. I don't know about small. It's a very big country. I live in a state with 40 million people. There's nothing small about any of the stuff that is touching me. But if we if we do all this village building and take care of ourselves, our community, and we're we're sending out the ripples, then that just gives our government the opportunity to just worry about big stuff. You know, like yeah. not getting in a war, not letting some freaking virus decimate our communities and our economy, you know, and maybe rein in some of the crazy stuff that's going on, you know, but Right now, we're just asking them to do everything. It's like, that ain't working either. So (laughs) many reasons to build a village here. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think, definitely think that that's what's there. So, yeah. So where can people find you? I know Krista does lots of excellent videos, you know, short shorts, uh, reels on Instagram that um, are very educational. So where can people find you? And I'll make sure that they're linked in the show notes. Yeah. So you can uh, definitely find a lot of the, the newest videos that I have coming out on my Instagram at Dementia Success Path is my handle. And uh, you could also find me on Facebook with the same handle and YouTube with the same handle as well. Uh, hopefully soon I'll get a TikTok going pretty soon because it seems like more and more uh, people that aren't teenagers are finally getting on TikTok now. Uh, so, uh, anyways, yeah, that's, that's where you can find me or my website, um, dementia success path.com. So if you can't remember dementia success path, it will be in the show notes. So you could just click the hot link and find, I'll, I'll link the Instagram and the website so you can find out more about Krista and all of the educational opportunities she has. Um, I love your videos because I love it. Cause I'm like, mm-hmm, yep, yep. I did that. I learned that. Yep. Okay, good. I did it right. <laughs> it's very reaffirming that. I I didn't provoke my mom's anger and do other things that made, you know, her life less enjoyable. 
that's that's a possible statement. That was always my goal to give her the most pleasure and joy possible without extending dying from Alzheimer's because trust me, 20 years was enough. <laughs> yeah, marathon. Yep. Oh, that was, yeah. That was one of those endurance, like the more than the 26.2 miles or whatever a normal marathon is. I forget what they call those. Ooh. Those, there was like, a, like, an, like an ultra marathon. <laughs> yeah, ultra, that's the, and I have a past guest that actually used to run like 100 miles a day for fun. I'm like, what kind of insanity wow. okay. is that? Okay. Huh. <laughs> yeah. All right. Oh, and they're in your state. So it's um, oh. um, Travis Macy is the son and Mark Macy is the dad with early onset Alzheimer's. They have a book called One Mile at a Time, and they were on the world's toughest race, Fiji, racing as a team with one member with Alzheimer's. So you can what? find that on, I believe it's Amazon Prime. Very excellent watch, especially because, you know, um, well, if I read the book, which is an excellent book, but... Um, I knew what the outcome was before the, the end of the sh this show. So it was like, okay, nothing like running the world's hardest race with a third challenge of Alzheimer's disease. Oh, well, there you go. So, yeah, I forgot what uh, part of Colorado they're in. But when I remember, I'll let you know. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you very much. And I hope you guys learned a little bit. And definitely check out Krista's Facebook or Instagram on future TikTok and, and learn more. All right. Thank you so much. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.